what things should you be able to do to run well on race day? And I'm telling you, the number one thing is that you have your endurance, strength and conditioning uh, run down pat. This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. In today's episode, we are going through how to prepare for a half Ironman properly, the exact training you need to do and the lead-up races you need to do to make sure that you get to the start line fully prepared for the requirements of a 70.3 and everything that it entails. Firstly, before we get into that topic, our normal starting segments, which we haven't done for a few weeks because we've had a few epic guests on. Dad, welcome to the episode. What are you grateful for? Thanks, George. Uh, yes, absolutely looking forward to talking about uh the necessary requirements for half Ironman today. It's going to be fun. Um, look, that's a great segue always because that's my gratitude is the unbelievable quality of guests that we have had uh, recently. Um, I keep pinching myself to to be able to interview people who are really at the top of their game, um, not only as athletes but as experts in their field, uh, whether they're scientists or whether they're <coughs> exercise physiologists or um, you know, having people who are the best of the best um, and getting them on the podcast is is just um, we're just so grateful for for that opportunity to to be able to um, ask them questions that we've always wanted to ask when you're reading some of the articles that they've written or listening to podcasts from other people um, to actually have the opportunity to ask whatever you like uh, and for them to openly answer um, and really give detail about uh, what they mean and. Um, and their version of how they see things in the world. Uh, it, it's just, yeah, we just, the podcast has been such a, a, a great opportunity and, and tool to um, to get to speak to some great people. And look, as a flow on from that, it's highly motivating uh, when you hear, um, you know, quality people who are so, I suppose, in love with what they do and and they love their job and it's it's sort of, it's inspiring because you can hear the the determination and the the excitement in their voice when they talk about topics that they're they're just passionate about and and that just it just motivates me and um, to to really continue to search on the journey of uh, to be a better version of yourself and for those athletes that we coach I know they love telling me each week oh that was unbelievable I just felt like getting out there and training again even though I'd already done my training session today um, and that's what I want to hear and you know for those people we don't coach hopefully you're getting the same uh, inspiration from uh, from you know learning how to do things better and so that you can actually compete to the best of your ability and enjoy the process and that wasn't there was so much evidence with that with Lockie Morton last week it was probably one of the the all-time best uh, interviews I'd done that we had done um, um, over the, I think we're into our third or fourth year, 160, 70 um, podcasts that we've done. Um, and it was, it was I felt th- like I'd just gone through a whole life uh, experience with him. Um, and the highs and lows that he's had through his life was uh, was epic, and and that that was also motivating to me to to really understand that you know we, we don't get a lot of opportunities in our life to do things that we want to do, and so you need to make the most of those opportunities uh, when they're presented to yourself, and and not to be putting off things because guess what you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You you, you could be in a crash. Uh, you know, hopefully not. But you know, life can take a different turn very quickly. So, when the opportunity is there for you, you should, you know, as long as everything else is in balance, you should be taking those opportunities uh, uh, to the best of your ability. So, yeah, that's that's my gratitude for this week. Mine was actually going to be exactly the same. So, I I guess I will just extend on that a little bit and just say feel very grateful and lucky to kind of live in this time in the world where this is possible you know the access to information is just it's never been been like this before in history and it's amazing the type of um, education you can get from podcasts and access to information around the world so I'm just very grateful for that you know there's a lot wrong with the world at the moment but this is definitely something that's very exciting to have and uh, you know we've watched a lot of for example um, Stephen Siler's content and the amount of times I've been watching content of him and then thought oh gee I wish I could ask him this question and then we got that chance to interview him for two hours and ask him all the questions 
we'd been thinking. So, um, yeah, definitely that is my gratitude and, um, yeah, just very grateful to have access to uh, these thought leaders in, in this industry that we're so passionate about. Moving on to our next segment, which is what has caught your attention? Yeah, this is uh, an interesting one. Uh, the world was really uh, shining on uh, cross-country. Uh, uh, it happens to be in Australia this year. Uh, the world cross country titles uh, move around the world uh, each year, and it was unbelievable that Australia got to, to host them. Um, it's a pity that the media didn't really get behind it, and half the half of the Australian population didn't know they were on, which is really disappointing. Um, but to have it at such an iconic place at Bathurst, uh, which is the home of uh, motor car racing, for those who don't know, who are listening from around the world, it's one of the big um, the big venues, or it's the venue for motor car racing in Australia. Um, the V8 supercars race around. Bathurst and it's got some epic hills in it um, and to have the world cross country titles at the same venue that would have been such a, a great advertisement to you know to say to all those people to get out and support it uh, the the cross country uh, supporters were there in their droves but it would have been good for for a few other people uh, to have a real good look at what the best uh, cross country athletes in the world are capable of doing and and it was so great to see um, after we talked to Stu McSwain about uh, two or three weeks ago with with his intention to try and get uh, the Australian team onto the podium and fantastic that they did uh they got third place and and literally there was only 10 or 20 meters between first second and third um so it was anybody's race to be and won fourth, so. and fourth yeah so yeah great great four uh man and woman effort uh two women two men um and yeah it was it was outstanding to, to actually get a podium at, at a you know a world title event absolutely um was there a second part to your court attention? Yeah, well, I just want to see if you want to discuss that first um, because then I wanted to go on to talk about the uh, OAC uh, topic. Um, but, yeah, what your thoughts on the World Cross Country? Uh, yeah, uh, it's very similar. Um, absolutely loved that it was in Australia. Would have loved more media coverage. Uh, unbelievable that Australia got that bronze. It was every runner in the team had to run their best to get that, which they did. Um and cross country is just so brutal um, in the women's event. It was absolutely cruel in the actual 10K um, event. Absolutely cruel what happened at the finish. Um, uh, you know, the leader was coming to the home straight. It looked like she was clearly going to win and the heat just got to her. She looked like she could have passed out anywhere from one and a half K to go when she'd broken away. There was two of them. Um, and the last hundred, it was, it's, we've seen this play out many times in the top of world sport, but she just started fading. There were 50 meters to go. She just collapsed um, just as second was absolutely charging her and passed her and she ended up not getting on the podium. So um, very cool finish and across country is like that. It just is so brutal on the legs and they push themselves so hard. Um, it's a great event. It doesn't get televised heaps, but it was, it was awesome to see it here. Yeah, look, one of the things that I, I didn't mention was um, the the difficulty of that course and we're going to talk a little bit about that in uh, preparation for Half Ironman and that – Steve Monaghetti on his commentary, I think he said he'd done 11. He'd represented Australia at 11 World Cross Country uh, Championships and he said that was by far the hardest course that he'd ever seen. Um, there was not one flat bit of terrain on that course. So you're either running through a boggy swamp that they you know, intentionally watered so that you had to feel like you're running through mud. Then you turned and ran straight up uh, really hard hills with little dips and rises along those hills and, and then through a vine a vine field uh, with grapes. It, it was really spectacular around uh, chicanes of, uh, of tyres, uh, car tyres. I, I think it had everything. And, you know, the best runners won. There was no doubt in my mind. It was. It didn't come down to a sprint. No, none of the races came down to a sprint, really. There was just someone just got away and, and the other runners in the field, men and women, either could hang on or they couldn't and the majority of the time it was they couldn't and uh, it was it was great to see an epic hard difficult course uh, get the best uh, outcome and after the event there has been a big announcement in uh, athletics for australia and it is kind of a world announcement i've seen it being plastered all over um, athletic sites around the world but um, there is a big club that has been getting a lot of uh, fame um, and attention recently and that's On Athletics Club and it's an athletics club founded um, and sponsored by the, the new running shoe that's getting a lot of hype which is On uh, Running Shoe Company 
Um, but over in the US, the On Athletics Club are making noise with the amount of results they're getting. Just in the last month, they've had one world record, one American record, one third best 5K run of all time. I, and I, actually, I think I've got that wrong. I think there's been multiple American records in there, both on the men's and women's side. So um, this new announcement has been pretty exciting for the Australian side of athletics. Yeah, and uh, Craig Mottram, who most people would um, know of his quality um, and his performances and his results, um, is an outstanding, um, one of the all-time greatest runners Australia's ever produced. And he's right on board with this. And, um, you know, he had a a stellar career, but he's now wanting to facilitate for up-and-coming Australians uh, to be a part of the new group. There's an Australian version, there's an American version, there's a European version of On Athletics. Uh, club, which I just think is is uh, the best thing. It's almost like uh, um, elite uh, cycling where you've got teams. Um, and I hope that this really takes off, that um, that it becomes like uh, on becomes one of the many teams. Like uh, the Melbourne Track Club started this um, a long, long time ago, which Craig Mottram was a part of. Um, and so, you know, giving athletes an opportunity to earn an income and get a, a wage, uh, train professionally under coaches, under supervised coaches, um, and the results are, are clear to be seen. And, you know, we've all often said that if you want to improve, surround yourself with people who are better than you and watch yourself improve because you aspire to go to the next level. And Stu McSwain said that in his podcast um, two or three weeks ago when he first joined the Melbourne Track Club, um, that he was the, the 10th fastest out of the 10 athletes in, in that group. And pretty much now he's equal fastest in that group. Um, and, you know, what should he do? Move on to another higher and better um, quality group and train with them. But the point is um, giving people the opportunity to, to really – pursue their career and for most Australians they would have to get a scholarship to an American uh, university and uh, enable themselves to continue their running um, with a scholarship um, that will you know enable them to have food and accommodation and at the same time get a degree or some sort of qualification while they're studying so that's the only pathway really for someone to 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 be full time um, from Australia whereas that that pathway is open to all Americans um, and a lot of Europeans have the same opportunities but uh, this is an opportunity for the Australian version um, uh, where they're going to be based in I think it's in Richmond in in the city and um, they've got a brand new gym and uh, exercise physiologists and physiotherapy and some funding to help them go to the the, the events they need to be at and and uh, give them an income um, and I just think it's you know it's we need more of this um, and you know you wonder why uh, British cycling went so well in the last decade or or 20 so ye- 20 years is because they they basically followed the Australian Institute of Sports model and did it better and got funding from uh, the lottery um, rather than the government paying for it, um, they got the lottery to pay for the funding for their athletes, and and they're world class athletes now, as swimmers, as runners, as um, cyclists. Uh, you know, you name any sport, the the English athletes are right up there, world class, because they've got something that's given the athletes an opportunity to function without having to worry about working. Um, and they can just concentrate on their on their chosen sport. So I think it's a great thing. Yeah, that that income thing is just so key because. Um, like you're saying, they can just concentrate on the whole The whole point of being an athlete in training is to be able to train and then recover from that training. And if you can't recover because you have to work on top of your training, you're just limiting yourself so much. And quite infamously, we have an athlete here in Melbourne who just went to the Olympics for the marathon and he's been one of uh, Australia's top long endurance runners, marathon runners, half marathon, 10K for a long time. That's Liam Adams. And he's notorious for being able to compete at this high level while being a full-time tradie. So he's on the tools all day, which is the most labor-intensive work you can do. And he's training for um, marathon to compete at the Olympics, you know, and that is just an impossible task. Whereas if these young athletes are now getting an opportunity out of school to earn an income and train properly, their development will just be so much better. So it is really exciting. Um. What's caught my attention is uh, just after the Lockie Morton interview last last week, I just want to touch on uh, one thing that he spoke about, um, and that is uh, the mindset of um, not having having to have everything go perfectly to perform well. And obviously, we like to be as well prepared as possible. We want to tick every single box. We're very about that at Travello, you know, having a clear race plan and here's what the goals are. But 
you have to be flexible as well and that things will go differently to plan. And there was a clear example we had in the Melbourne to Warney a few weeks ago. One of our athletes, I just wanted to give a big shout out to him. He turned up to the start line and he'd had problems with his bike all week and he'd been in the shop multiple times trying to fix it. It looks like they'd fixed the, fixed the issue. Um, but you rocked up, started doing a bit of a warm up, and his gears weren't working. And you're about to do a 260 kilometer road race and your gears stopped working. And he was as resourceful as possible. He went around to every single team and just politely asked um, the team bike mechanics, does anyone have any, a, a solution to this? Um, and one guy who was a really good bike mechanic said, you cannot fix this now. It's it's not possible to fix right now after having a look over his bike. And instead of uh, you know wallowing in self-pity and cracking the sads, um, he figured out that he could, tr- he could, he could swap the big – chain ring and the small chain ring so we had two gears he just couldn't swap the back ones so he got the gear into in the back into what would be pedalable if he just was able to swap between into the small chain ring for the hills and a big chain ring on the flat and decide he was going to ride the race and see how he went and see how long he could last for and he rode the entire thing stuck with the main group of the peloton um which is a bunch of elite nrs riders um in, in two gears, which is just absolutely incredible. If you know how hard this race is, if you know how tough it is, how tough it is just to stay in the peloton with all your gears, how good of a rider you have to be. Um, and for him just to do it in two gears, I think is a great testament to a flexible attitude. And he didn't complain once. Once he started riding, no one even knew that that's what he did. So I just wanted to give that shout out. I, I, I just want to butt in there. Um, because I was the driver of our team for that particular day, I'm said to the on the radio just as you all started are you okay nick to ride and his answer was yep all good in, instead of saying no my fucking mic doesn't work but i'm gonna see how i go but he just answer was yep all good and i thought actually that he got it fixed that's what i thought because I, it was five minutes before i'd driven into the car before you started the race i thought oh he must have fixed it because his choice was get in the car with me and watch the race or see how he goes and you know the attitude that he had was was that's the mindset you need to do uh if things are going to go against you you've got to come up with solutions um and they may not be the best solution but if you want to keep keep going you've got to get around these roadblocks and it's a great lesson I will shout out his name for anyone that wants to know. It was Mitch Lawkins. So if anyone uh, in knows our Traveller group, uh, he was a guest on this podcast because he owns the running company uh, here in Melbourne, which is a shoe store. So that was him. So if you do run into him, you can give him a shout out for that effort. Um, but uh, there was also one more thing I want to mention, um, specifically a post Lockheed Morton interview as well. And that was oh, a correction to um, some news we had spoken about a few weeks ago in Peter Sagan's retirement. I did want to make one clear correction on that is that he has is retiring from road cycling, um, but he has come out and, and clearly said that he's not retiring from cycling overall. His first love was mountain bike riding, um, and he wants to finish his career doing that. And specifically, he wants to have a crack at Paris uh, 2024, uh, mountain biking, and he wants to have a crack at cyclocross events and a lot of the, the off-road events. Um, so we, will, might, we might still see Peter Sagan at the top of his game uh, just doing a lot of the alternative events. And I thought this was very, really timely with the World Cross Champs just happening in the last few weeks where it's Van der Poel and Van Aert who have this unbelievable rivalry that just keeps going. We see athletes like cyclists like Tom Pidcock who have come across from cyclocross and, and mountain biking who are just unbelievable on the road and he had one of the best stages of the Tour de France last year based on his descending um, with Sagan now going across to mountain biking um, and everything we spoke about last week with uh, with Lockie in terms of the alternate cycling calendar. I just feel like this is becoming more and more popular and this, this cross-training style might become more and more appealing to athletes because um, it, it is actually a really good training style and it clearly works. I mean, Van der Poel and Van Aert are two of the best road cyclists in the world even though they're doing all this off-road stuff and potentially – and more athletes will see benefit in this cross training style, and maybe it'll make them better road cyclists than just stick into a pure pure road cycling. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a great point you raise, and um, it's something that we've actually during the uh, basically COVID period of those two or three years, we almost came to the same conclusion that um, that that type of threshold riding. And for those who don't know, the the, the cyclocross is basically a one hour um, as hard as you can go. Um, and there's, I think there might be 12 uh, World Cup races before they got to the world titles um, for the season. It's a very short season, uh, but each week or each five days or whatever the, the venues are, there's a one-hour threshold ride in 
in in real terms. It's a one hour threshold ride. And it's a full body threshold. It's not just your legs as you would do on a road bike where you've got smooth, beautiful bitumen roads. You're going through sand on the beach, you know, with water lapping up to your feet. Then you're getting off your bike, running upstairs. Then you're going through mud, slipping sideways. Um, you know, it's a full body experience where your arms, shoulders, back, your, your, your glutes, your stomach, you know, everything's being put through the ringer for, for one hour of flat out training. And we found the same thing when we did some handicap races that were only 35 to 40 minutes once a week. Um, that were everybody on the limit as a handicap, you have to ride together. And so because you're in a team, it pushes you to ride harder. Um, and at the end of that eight to 10 week period, which is similar to what the the cross training, uh, cross fitness bike uh, races are, um, you're just doing these threshold rides that are just giving you this unbelievable good base. Um, uh, and when you come to the road season, you sort of, it's almost contradictory to that that off season being you know sl- long slow uh, aerobic fitness type of riding, which we all th- we all agree is important. But we also know that there's a lot of data telling us that if you do that plus one intensity at threshold during that period, you'll come out for your main part of your season a much better athlete. Totally agree, and yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many riders we now see come back from from those events that didn't maybe originally start in road cycling and then how many are using these alternative events to potentially get better. It is will be fascinating to see. But enough on that. Let's get into the topic of today, which is how to prepare for a half Ironman properly. And there's sort of five keys we want to go through in terms of getting your training right and making sure that, again, the goal of this is to um, understand there are certain requirements you need to be adequately prepared for to get through this race as good as well as possible. And so the first one, the first key point we want to talk about is uh, how much time do you need to allow to prepare for a 70.3? Well, I'm going to start off with the predictable answer. It depends. And we've we've used this uh, response to a lot of questions in our podcast. And I want to clarify, it's, it's not a cop-out answer. It is a reality answer. So if you come to if you come to the realization that you want to do a half Ironman in 16 weeks time or 20 or 10 weeks time, the type of athlete you are at that current time determines whether that's a feasible um, expectation. So if you're a brand new triathlete to the sport, that's not a, a feasible or realistic expectation. You need you know, near on six months um, to get yourself ready. And some people may need 12 months if they've actually not, not ridden a bike before. Uh, or never done a triathlon. So your current experience is one thing. Um, what have you done in the sport? The second thing is, what is your fitness base? If you're at the lowest fitness base that you are have, have had in, in the past five years or two years or one year, then you're going to need more time to get your fitness up before you can actually start being specifically training towards an event that has clear, you know, understanding of how to how hard it is to do a half Ironman, you need to understand where your fitness level is. So if you find you're at rock bottom, then you need more time. So so there's two caveats that you need to understand is what your experience is and and how fit you are for the requirements of potentially a five to six hour event, an endurance event that's that's going to ask you to swim for, you know, between 30 and 40 minutes to ride between two hours and three hours 30, depending on your level, and run between an hour 10 and two hours 50 or three hours, depending on your level. So so right from the off- offset, um, the less experience and the poorer fitness level you have, the more time you need. So if you can get that uh, right, then you're going to give yourself more chance. If you're someone who's experienced and have been regularly doing these events, then you can pretty much switch from your training in eight weeks. If you decide there's a oh okay there's a new event or one of my events got cancelled as we experienced during COVID, I need to prepare for another event. If you've been training the right way with a really good uh, variety uh, program that enables you to keep your endurance, your intensity, um, your zone two stuff traveling along together, then it's easy for you to switch from for eight to ten weeks to get yourself race ready for that event. So there's quite a contrasting examples of um, of how much time a person needs. So uh, that's the point I want to get across. Yeah, and that's that has to be said from the start. You, before we have any conversation about about this, it just we just have to provide that context. And you know, eight to ten weeks is the upper extreme example of a really 
probably experienced athlete who's, who's quite fit. And then the lower example you spoke about, which is a complete beginner who's not very fit, would need at least a year. Uh, ideally, in an absolute ideal world, they give themselves a full year to be adequately prepared, to not rush their training, to not risk overtraining or injury. But we do want to create some categories in between that of just some general time frames. And I think we'll start at this lower end. A beginner, you know, who's who's not very fit, you're saying, yeah, <laughs> preferably at least a year. But that can go down to someone who's coming across from another sport. They might have finished um, a running career or a cycling career or a swimming career or some sort of career in another sport and they're very fit, but they're kind of new to triathlon as a whole. That could probably come down to maybe at a minimum six months plus. Would you say that's probably um, that kind of range that you're looking at for a beginner? Look, it's it's very individual, Jordan, and, and you'd have to take it person by person. So, you know, there's there's so many variables that you've already mentioned in that in that two-minute sentence. Um but the, the key thing that you must think about when you're asking for help from a coaching group is what is your um, expectation of your performance? So, so once you have established that my goal is just to finish the damn thing, then you, if you've got no experience, poor fitness level, and you only got 12 weeks, the answer is yes, you can get through it. It will be a horrible experience, but yes, you can get through it. So there's an example of someone whose expectation is, I, I just want to do it and I've only got a limited time because this is happening in my life. I'm, maybe I'm having a baby or maybe I'm getting married. I'm changing jobs. I'm moving interstate or whatever the reason and I just want to tick this one off, then of course you can do it um, if you concentrate on whatever you've got in the time available to get yourself as well prepared as you can. The performance will be at that level of the fitness you are. And if you gave that same person another six weeks or another 16 weeks, their performance would be up 10%. Another 20 weeks, they'd be up 15 or 20%. So the longer you give yourself, the better the performance will be on the day. So you have to un- you have to make it clear in your mind, is it uh, outcome-based or just for me to successfully complete the event. Um, so the longer you, the longer you give yourself, uh, the better version you'll be of yourself, and therefore the result will reflect that. So that's really important. Perfect. This, and we can kind of categorize that into three different types of goals. You know, it's just complete it. There's complete it comfortably in quotation marks, where you can get through it. It's not a horrible experience, and then there's complete it with a best time in mind you know where you're really trying to get the absolute most out of yourself and like you're saying um depending on the category depending on um where you're at with your fitness and your experience um those three scenarios will um, result in um different ideal time frames but uh, i guess we just want to give people a concrete answer that um the longer you give yourself the better and the more prepared you are you don't need to overdo it so an intermediate up to experienced athlete don't don't need to train for a full year just for one event it is a long time to to prepare for one event um, we find that anywhere from that four to six month mark for anyone in those categories uh, is generally a good time but yeah that that is dependent on where they're coming from in their fitness um, their exact goals etc but we just wanted to give some general answers that aren't just uh, leaving things right up in the air right yeah absolutely and at the end of the day um, once you've answered your own questions then you'll have a clear a clear pathway and um, the day will be difficult whether you're just trying to finish it it'll be difficult if you're well trained and you're and you're getting through it comfortably uh, and it will be difficult if you're an elite uh, pointy end of your age group um, y- your intensity is re- re- reflective of what, where your level of fitness is at so people think that if the fitter you are the more prepared you are the easier it is it's actually not true it's the same feeling of this is hard um, and it's just you you're you're coping with it at a higher a higher level than if you were a lot fitter. So there will be periods where the the person who's prepared poorly and hasn't paced it or executed very well will have a worse experience um, than the person. You know, if, if two p- person A and person B had very poor fitness, very uh, few experiences at this event, one prepared and executed well, one prepared poorly and had a horrible execution. They went too hard too early. Those same people with the same base level of fitness will have completely different experiences on the day. And so so that comes into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. The only time I would say that that's not the case, and it's the last point on this, is that yeah, is the underpreparedness. If you're going in underprepared, you no matter what you do, how well you execute, it will still be most likely a horrible experience. Um, 
it's just a different feeling compared to it's a different type of hardness compared to the person that's prepared because they're pushing themselves because they can not because the event's forcing it on them yeah and also the person who's underprepared is more than likely going to be at some point going to be stopped in their tracks and they may have to walk for huge sections of the run which is just that's what we're saying is not enjoyable um you know you are as we've said many times trying to do a swim bike and a run not a swim bike and a walk um, so you know, it's 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 a real credit to people who can who can run from start to finish because uh, they're executed well. Um, whether they're doing uh, a two hour thirty half marathon or whether they're doing a one hour ten half marathon, it doesn't matter. If you can maintain the same pace from start to finish that's based around your plan, you've had a successful day. As, as I say, whether you've run for two and a half hours, that could be a PB. You, you, you know, your previous best could have been two hours 45, but, and you've not, you've not run once. Um, so, you know, they're the things that you should be taking out of uh, the, the outcome. Next, we want to go through it in simple chronological order, and that's just go through how to be prepared for the swim, the bike, and the run. So let's start with the swim, and and where do you start with here? Well, again, where's your level when you come to come to practicing for your swimming? And you know, we're trying to swim a nineteen hundred meter uh, event. It could be in a lake, it could be in a river, it could be in an ocean. So already you've got three different variables. One's tidal um, and two have no salt water content and one has salt water. So the flotation levels in an ocean are different to a lake and a river. Um, so there will be certain amount of uh, skill that you need to uh, get yourself on for the swim, which is quite different. There is skill in running and riding, but it is way more technically um Kinesiology wise, um, stroke technique is so key to use swimming uh, more uh, fluently and more efficiently and uh, with less energy expenditure than it is uh, on a bike or as a runner. So if you can spend equal amount of time cor- you know, correcting your technique and getting some help, um, that would be one thing. Um, preparing yourself with some sort of endurance type training with some intensity in the, in the water, in the pool. Um, so equal amounts of time with drills, uh, practicing practicing uh, your skill technique, and if you if you haven't been critiqued, you need to get that done, um, and then practice the advice that you've been given, uh, and also get your aerobic fitness in the water uh, up to a level that you can cope with, you know, between twenty two minutes and and forty minutes of swimming, depending on your level. Um, so so we know that this is the least time um, in the actual uh, half Ironman, so we would advise that two swims per week um, would be the minimum requirement. Um, if you could do three, that would be a, a bonus of which one of them, um, if it's possible during summer, to get outdoors rather than doing all three swims in a pool. I know that's not possible for a lot of people and um, you just have to make do with what you can. But the key things are getting your aerobic fitness up, um, making sure that you try to swim sometimes uh, in similar venues and conditions that you're going to experience on race day and making sure that your, your skill technique is, is being practiced regularly. Yeah, and I guess we always look at the distance and swimming um, in this case and in a 70.3 as a whole, um, it's very achievable in training. So not while 1,900 metres is a long time to be swimming straight uh, in an event and for any for any age group athlete, that's between 25 and 45 minutes of swimming, uh, which is a long time to be swimming at once. It's it's achievable to achieve to do that and more in training. You know your training sessions can build up to two to three kilometers long, which makes you it makes it uh, makes you very comfortable at swimming that distance in the actual race. Yeah, I was just thinking about that myself. Um, there's the um, there's an event in, on the weekend coming up in Australia. It's the Australian Long Course uh, Titles at Huskisson, and uh, I was just thinking about my own training, and I was quite worried. You know, probably six to eight weeks ago, that I hadn't really been doing the correct swimming training. And, you know, quite proud of myself when I was coming back from the Listerfield Lake, which is a local lake where I swim, um, and thinking, well, you know, I have actually done quite a few over two-kilometer swims between two and three-kilometer swims. And 
and all of a sudden my confidence level grows and that should be the same for every athlete that that's out there if if you've done plenty of swims where you've done more than the swimming distance requirement of the race then you should be confident and comfortable that on race day that that can be achievable Um, if you haven't done up to 1900 meters then that should be one of your key goals is to build from whatever you're capable of if you're only capable of swimming 500 meters in the first swim you go to start there and progress yourself from that point over the period of time that you have between now and the race day and you know we hope that's not four weeks time but we hope it's possibly 12 or 16 weeks and just try to progress your distance slowly over that time period and then all of a sudden your body adapts very quickly it doesn't get fatigued as quickly as if you just tried to swim 1900 meters straight from the outset Um, so yeah like everything you want to progress slowly so the body adapts and doesn't feel like it's exhausted and fatigued so we can say the exact same thing for cycling and running Uh, that's the exact same principles apply it all depends on where you're at right now and building up to the um the distance required so let's move on to the bike and talk about the 90 kilometer race and how do we best uh prepare ourselves for this and ideally what would you see a client doing you know right up until that last race ready block um to give them the best chance of performing as well as possible in a 90k time trial and again i'll use the same principle so you know Let's look at how long the time on the bike will be. And it could be anything from two hours to uh, four hours possibly. Um, so so if you're a person who's in the three-hour uh, range for the 90K on race day, you need to be doing – building yourself up from – if your longest ride has been an hour, you need to start progressing that over the journey between now and race day by adding time each week. And you need to go past your three-hour race time if we're using that as an example. You, you would be far better off you know, building that up to at least four hours and, and incorporating a lot of hills into, into those training sessions um, so that you build the strength and the endurance at the same time. Um, the stronger you are on the bike, the better off you'll be um, come, come event day. And, and these are things that, uh, that are really important early on in the program. Um, and once you've got that really good base of strength and endurance, then you can start to do more race-specific stuff. So once you feel like you've got the base of strength and endurance into your body and you, and you can cope with that and your body can adapt to that and you're not pulling up sore, you're not pulling up fatigued and lying on the couch for, for the whole Saturday or Sunday afternoon um, and being absolutely useful, useless to your wife or your partner or yourself, um, then you start to look at the requirements of what the race is after. And some races are pancake flat. Some races have got incredible amount of elevation in it and some races are everything in between. So establishing what the race requirements are in terms of terrain will determine how you train the next race ready. We call the race ready phase, that can be anything from 10 weeks out to as little as six or four weeks out. Again, depending on your level um, of fitness and your level of experience. For those athletes who are doing uh, multiple half Ironmans in a season, like four half Ironmans over a period of 12 months, you wouldn't need as many race-ready uh, sessions as someone who's who's not done any race-ready sessions. Um, the race-ready sessions that we talk about are, are getting you to do endurance rides where you're riding exactly at the power and the speed that you expect to do on the actual race day. And that can be broken up into intervals or it can be a solid block of 1x60, 1x75k or 1x90k. They're examples of practice sessions that you should be doing to prepare yourself for what's going to happen on race day. You can break up a three-hour session into, you know, a warm-up, a cool-down and two hours worth of uh, 4x30-minute intervals or 3 by 40 or 2 by 60 anything like that that's going to give you um, an experience on the bike in the race position tt position uh, where you're having to ride at your power number that you expect to do on race day and you can you know you can find so much out about yourself on those training sessions you know what speed does 200 watts equal if i do a course that's out and back Um, and the athletes that we coach know these sessions very well and come race day it's a no-brainer because you've done these sessions multiple times in training so you just slot straight back into what you've done in training on race day and no matter what's going on around you you just hone in on your numbers and and you're almost oblivious to whatever everybody else around you is doing 
uh, unless you're in an unfortunate position where you find yourself in a pack where you actually can't push the numbers you're trying to because there's people around you in the way. Um, so there are exceptions to the rules for riding, which is different to swimming. But but the preparedness um, for the bike comes down to getting yourself aerobically fit with endurance and strength as the key components. And then once you've got that established, then you can start to be very specific about the power and the speed that you're going to ride on race day and do those sessions, you know, four, six, eight, ten weeks out from your actual race event. And there, it's actually a surprising prescription for a lot of people because the idea of either doing a 90 kilometer time trial in training seems absurd um, or doing these long you know, race specific sessions. But we can't forget that a half Ironman is not an intense race. The whole race is done well below threshold and that's why we call them race specific or sub threshold sessions. And so four by 30 minutes or two by 60 minutes in intervals in quotation marks seems like a lot, but you're doing it at a lot lower intensity than you probably imagine for an interval, a traditional interval session. You know, it's in the race, you're going to be riding anywhere between 75 to 90% of your FTP. And when you're when you're riding at 80% of your FTP, it's a lot easier than you think. And in the actual race, it's quite intense because you've just done a 1900 meter swim. You've got a half marathon to do after. So it all combined, it adds up to a lot more. But in these sessions, they once you get used to them, they're a lot easier and easier is always relative, but they're a lot easier than probably anticipated. They do get hard, believe me. But uh, but that's when you you should be you know tr- practicing practicing exactly what you want to do on race day in these training sessions. Um, you know, if you're if you're experimenting with how can I ride today at 85% of my threshold um, in the first two efforts and can I do that in the third effort? And next week I'm going to try and ride 87% of my threshold and see what happens in my fourth effort or fifth effort. And then, you know, you're all the time experimenting. What happens if I ride at 90% in the first effort? Do I fade? Um, so you you come to race day with all these scenarios that you've already experienced, and and don't forget we've we've banged on about this many times. Race specificity is one of the most important things that you'll ever do in training. If you can manufacture something that's resembling your race day experience in training, come race day it will be so much more palatable on the body. Um, you'll feel like you're just in another training session even though it's a race you can rise to the occasion and possibly do better than you will do on race day but the expectation isn't the expectation is that you would stay within your numbers and therefore you will be able to run better Um, so so riding to the numbers that you know you can do in training and then in training run off the bike practicing this will be so confidence boosting to you come come the actual day of the race and don't underestimate how important the nutrition practice is during these training sessions because we want to practice the amount of calorie expenditure at the intensity of the race. There's no good practicing your nutrition when you're riding at 50 or 60% of, of your FTP when on race day you could be riding at 82 or 90 or 75. So you need to practice the nutrition requirements at the intensity of your race day. Spot on. I uh, just want to quickly mention that uh, the midweek sessions are very similar to what they are normally, and that's that's trying to help improve your ability to um, your your threshold capacity, your FTP, and then your ability to ride at that. So it's always including. We've spoken about this on many podcasts, but including VO2 sets, whether they're 30 second efforts or three minute efforts, plus some more th- uh, intervals at threshold. So five by five or three by eight, for example, sometimes up to three by 12. They're kind of what the midweek looks like. But I guess the key that you are always trying to get into athletes is they have to get to these race specific sessions. And you're generally getting an athlete to do at least one 60 to 75 kilometer time trial a bit further out and then one 90 kilometer time trial a bit closer to race day and that is kind of a minimum requirement in your head right yeah and you know we've just spoken specifically about uh the requirements of the race and we've talked about the endurance ride which is the key part of it and you've mentioned already that you know during the week we, we're really concentrating on other things we're trying to you know if if i if you came to me and you said look i rode 38 k's an hour and that was 320 watts, how do I ride 40 k's an hour next race? Um, And my answer is going to be, you need to have your FTP at 325 watts. And how do we do that? We need to do some intensity. Of course, we need to to keep our endurance and uh, strength and conditioning going, but we need to concentrate on lifting our intensity so that our threshold rises. So that's the only way you're going to be able to ride on race day faster is if you do those high intensity sessions midweek. 
So the week on the bike is broken up into obviously um, threshold sessions or over threshold sessions, such as you've mentioned VO2 um, and the endurance ride. So, so those three combinations uh, are going to enable you each time you get on the bike to, to be a better version of what you were in the previous race. Plus, any bonus zone two riding you, you can fit in the week is only going to benefit you uh, from wherever you can to make sure that uh, your body is getting that uh, aerobic fitness benefit, but not so much that you're, you're doing too many sessions that your body's not used to. Uh, you don't build that up too quickly and your body ends up overtraining. So, we take all these principles that we've already spoken about with swimming and then everything you just spoken about with riding and how do we apply that to running and getting the most out of a half marathon at the end of a 70.3. And it's kind of different now we we talk about the run because the run will be dictated to by how you actually perform the swim and the bike on race day. So if you you perform above yourself on the swim and way above yourself on the bike, no matter how well prepared you are as a runner, the outcome will be normally a disappointment. And that's probably very typical of a lot of the results that we see across the board at most half Ironman races that we look at results of and that we actually go and physically um, uh, watch on race day where we see people uh, starting their run looking like a certain runner and then halfway through looking like a completely different runner. Um, they're basically falling apart. So so preparing for a half Ironman as a runner, you still have the same principles as a swimmer and a bike rider with overload, um, endurance, strength, um, some some form of intensity and some form of race specificity where you're matching your half Ironman predicted time that you're wanting to do, predicted pace, I, I should say. Time is, is a relative term because a lot of the races are 20.1 or 22.3 or hardly any of them are 21.1. So, you know, if we have ever got a, a race that was 21.1 exactly, it would be, you know, a revelation really but but so the time is not that important it's more what pace you're you're trying to run at so so we're really trying to get yourself uh prepared normally in training with those specific things we talked about for swim bike and run but the difference is on race day if you have if you have not done what you wanted to do in your race plan and you've overcooked it no matter how well prepared you are as a runner you will not be able to run the pace you expect to run and so So I suppose when we're preparing for half Ironman, we have to take that factor in for the running component. And that is a key thing that people need to remember is is the run will only be the outcome you want if you've done the swim and the ride the way you should have and not the way you've ended up doing it. Um, so, so the massive difference in, in the three legs that we've talked about, um, and the fourth leg is always nutrition. Um, if you've, if you've swam and raced in the plan and you expect to run the way you should, because you've swam and run properly, but you've neglected the nutrition, the outcome on the run will be similar to as if you've done the plan for swim and bike wrong. Um, so it's not really a three leg event. It's a four leg event. It's a swim, bike and run and nutrition. Um, so get those things right and then you will be able to run at the level that you expect to and want to and and that's the fun part of triathlon and the smiles on people's faces when they actually get to come home down the finishing chute physically strong and not not creeping to the line but rather charging to the line um, it, it, it's it's as a coach it's just one of the, the best things you can experience uh, to see your athlete go from from hating the experience and somehow lining up for another race and or the opposite is just you know having the best day out and enjoying the whole thing and then get into the end saying i should have gone harder which which you know is something it's very rarely said in, in any <laughs> yeah. endurance event yeah exactly so you touched on there that the, the principles of training are the same you need to be doing an endurance run that matches or exceeds the distance that you'll end up running uh, on the day you need to have some intensity in there. Um, but what specific sessions can people do to get race specific? Like we spoke about the bike, how can they best prepare for the intensity of the race and what's going to happen in a half marathon off the bike? Well, before you talk about that that specific uh, um, run that we do that uh, that that um, has got the race specificity of the event, we've got to make sure that our endurance run is one that's it's really made us a stronger runner. So if you live in an area that's pancake flat, you, you're going to be dis- disappointed with what's going to happen on race day because you don't have the ability to build the resilience and strength in your body 
to be strong in the second half to hold the pace you want to that you've that you've aimed at for the first half. And that is the big downfall for most people. They've set a pace that they think they can hold. They hold it for half the race or even three quarters of the race and then fall apart in the last third or half or quarter. Um, and that's the disappointing part. And that comes down to that endurance. And it doesn't sound like that specific, does it, to your race requirement. You know, you're asking me that question, what, what things should you be able to do to run well on race day? And I'm telling you the number one thing is that you have your endurance, strength and conditioning uh, run down pat. If you, if you have run, say your ex- expectation is to run an hour 45 for your half marathon or an hour 50 or two hours, you need to be doing training sessions that are longer than an hour 45, an hour 50 or two hours. You don't have to run them at the same pace. In fact, I don't care about what pace you're running as long as it's uh, talking pace where you're not being pushed. Um, but what I want you to do is concentrate on getting elevation. Uh, the more elevation you can get into your legs, not right at the start because that load will be too high on the body, but as you progress from maybe 100 metres of elevation, working way up to 120, 150, 170, 200, up to 300, up to 500 metres of elevation over a period of 26 weeks or 30 weeks, then your body will be able to cope with that. And come race day, you will be as strong as you've ever been in the second half. And that will be the key thing to enable you to run a fast half marathon. Uh, One other trick we use is um, uh, race pace runs off the bike. And we don't do this every time because we're not trying to put too much intensity of running in our week, but we definitely include after some of these big uh, race specific bike sessions or long endurance sessions, um, sometimes a 5k run off the bike at your race pace. So you really get used to that first 5k and then sometimes that builds up to 7k or 10k or, or 13k off the bike um, at that race pace. And so that really gets that specificity of that feeling that you're going to have um, in the actual race in training, which is, which is really quite important. Yeah, and again, that's determined by your level of experience and also your level of fitness. Um, and we can't put that on people who are really new to the sport. Um, we can only give that to people who have done multiple races, um, whose body can cope with that. Um, because, you know, traditionally you would do that on a, a race ready cycle race with a run off the bike at race pace, at your half Ironman race pace, and then expect the next day to go and do your strength and endurance run. So that is a big two days where if you're not able to cope with that that can be quite detrimental and remember you've run already three times during the week so and in one of those sessions you'll be doing some more heel repeats or some strength work of some type so so it is a quite uh, specific running program that we give for half Ironman um, that enables people to run the same pace from start to finish and that's the key thing I'm trying to get across here is different to the swim and bike in some ways, but same in others. The goal is to run the same pace from start to finish uh, in a half marathon in a half Ironman. And if you can do that, you would have ticked off those race-specific runs off the bike. You would have ticked off those hill repeats. You would have ticked off those strength and conditioning runs that uh, over the distance time that you're going to do on race day. And you will have unbelievable confidence once you've done that your first time, um, A, to go and train the same way and better, and B, for your next race to know that I can actually run this pace and maybe faster next time. And they're the, the fun parts that you have at the end of the race when you're doing the post-race analysis with our athletes that uh, can't wipe the smile off their face. You know, I've just done a PB overall. And why was the PB so good? Mainly because of the run. Uh, they improved 10, 15 minutes in their run, five minutes in their run. Sure, they might have improved 30 seconds in the swim, a minute on the swim, or in some cases, five minutes on the bike, or you know, many cases, 10 minutes. But but the biggest improvement is from the run and the experience of uh, satisfaction uh, when you run uh, strong uh, and you're running against people who are slowing down. You are actually not running faster. You're running the same pace, but other, everybody around you is slowing down. So you do feel the exuberance and exhilaration of I'm flying uh, compared to everybody else. Uh, But the reality is you're not. You're just holding the pace that that you're aspiring to. To finish off, I want to give some some bonus tips that you really have to think about and consider when preparing for um, a half Ironman. And each of these could be a topic in themselves that you do a full episode on, but I want you to uh, give the one key tip for each of these topics and the key purpose behind it, you know, why it's so important. So we'll start off with, uh, lead up races or practice races and making sure that 
the, the actual race, your goal race, isn't the first time you're doing this event. And this this goes for every sport. I don't care whether you're a cross trainer, cyclist, um, gravel rider, you know, endurance swimmer. You, you need to have events that are under race conditions that make you prepare the night before, the week before, etc. Um, the morning of, um, the warm up, um, and having having those experiences, um, and then going through the actual event. Um, set you up beautifully for when it counts the most, when your A race comes. Um, so the more of these events that can be spread out well enough so that you're recovering from it and not losing too much time in preparing for a, a B or a C race where you don't have to taper more than a day or two, um, these are invaluable experiences not only in the preparation but in the execution. And then you can have a real good look at your post-race analysis about what things do I need to improve on? And it, it will be hitting you smack in the face that, geez, I just I was crap at the start of the swim. I didn't get anybody's feet. I swam crooked. I, I rode too hard at the start of the bike. I didn't know that there was that many hills in it. Um, I rode the hills too hard. I, I had so many time periods in zone one. You know, I got off the bike and ran way too fast. All the typical things that, that you know, hit you in the face and say, well, I'm not going to do that next time. I've already made that mistake. Um, so so many reasons why you would use lead up races um, and you wouldn't finally want to just have a six month period or 20 weeks of just training where you don't know what's going to happen on race day. Your only time you're going to find out is on race day. Um, and that's easy in a half Ironman, harder in, a, in an Ironman, but it's easy in a half Ironman to do mini, mini races where you might be doing a 1K swim, uh, 60K ride and a, a 12K run. There are examples that you could do yourself um, in a training session uh, along the journey of your period from now till race day. So all of these experiences will, will not only help prepare you for what the expectation is on race day, but it's also good stepping stones um, along that journey to see how you're performing and where you are, where's your form. What's the key tip in the next point, which is how to taper properly for a 70.3? Well, this is a hard one because every single person should really have a variation of the of the proper taper. Um, and what is the proper taper? And that's the question on everybody's mind. And it's so individual that we can almost say there isn't one. Um, I've certainly experimented over 20 or 30 years with variations in taper, but I know that I coach people who do well with a harder couple of days before race day. I know I coach people who do well with complete rest before race day and everything in between so you know the answer to that question is what works best for you is what you should do i guess the how is as less important as what the goal is and the goal is shed fatigue and get to race day where you you feel really really good to perform and you're only going to find that out after multiple races and that's another good reason why lead up practice races are good because you can work out you know, if you've done a little mini taper and didn't work so well, I was so tired and my legs were so trashed on, on the practice day, well, I won't do that on race day. Um, after the event, it's always a good good post-race analysis time to do that and find out exactly what went well or what didn't go well for the next time you do this race. Generally, we're finding that majority of athletes are having a taper of, you know, seven to 10 days plus where they're not doing any major, long or majorly intense sessions. Um, but they, they're still doing intensity in that week leading up. Um, it's just a lot shorter um, and the volume is, is cut down a bit. Yeah, look, the taper is very specific and we, we have, um, you know, gone into some depth in some of the podcasts about it. But, you know, it, it is an important part and you need to find out from your own experience what works best for you and help your coach with that and tell your coach, look, I felt like I've done better when I've done this type of taper and the coach will work you work with you on that. The next bonus uh, point is the race plan. So what is, what's the key understanding um, of um, the purpose of a race plan? Yeah, understanding where you are at on race day. And once you understand that, then the numbers should be real. They're not fictitious ones that you hope to do. They're numbers that you've done in training. And so that's the answer that you have to ask yourself. Um, you know, the question you have to ask yourself and the answer is where am I at in the last month of training? And that's why we do some pre-race testing prior to our main event. So we have the final peaked rested uh, trials for swim, bike and run that are going to formulate our race plan. And, and they're really key. 
and they they should be the most up to date exact example of what your capacity and capabilities are uh, come race day. Um, so so you go into the race with a plan that's based on actual factual data, not on fictitious I want to, I hope I can, let's see what I can do type of attitude. Uh, no, I'm going in knowing that I'm going to swim 140 per 100 pace. I'm going to, I'm going to ride at 36 k's an hour based on my power and I'm going to run at 440 pace based on my, my running my running time trials. The fourth leg of the triathlon, the fourth discipline that you already spoke about, nutrition. What do we? What do you want to say about that to finish? Um, I guess it comes back to why, how important the practice and lead-up races are and the yeah, lead-up training I, sessions. I just don't want to repeat myself, but I have to. If you don't practice this in training, you're going to have a, a really uncomfortable experience, whether your gut is hurting you, you feel like vomiting, or you feel like going to the toilet. They're the three things that are going to be the worst case scenarios because you've tried something on race day that you actually haven't done in training. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than doing a race where you have to go to the toilet for the majority of the time. It's so uncomfortable. It's so distracting and it takes away from the fun. Um, and if there's no toilet nearby and you have to hang on, you can't, can't actually concentrate on what you're doing. Um, if you've got an upset tummy because you've you know, you've had a bad breakfast or the gel's gone down wrong or uh, the combination you've used is uh, not diluted enough or you've grabbed something you haven't had before. Again, racing with an upset tummy is distracting. It takes away from the performance. Feeling nauseous. There are other things that, you know, having the wrong fueling on the day. The, these things have to be nutted out way before race day. And as we spoke about in in the preparation phases of of the swim, bike and run, you need to actually practice the nutrition at the intensity of race day. And so, and write that stuff down. Each week you do your training sessions, keep notes in a diary. I was a bit underdone today. I might need another 10 grams of carbs. Oh, that was way too much. I had plenty le- plenty of carbs. I didn't, I wasn't even hungry. That probably I could try to go a little bit less carbs uh, because really, basically we don't want to over fuel ourselves. We want to if anything, just be under so we can always top up. Um, we don't want to be empty so that we're trying to catch up. Um, but, you know, the only way to get this nutrition right is to practice it and, and take detailed notes of what you're doing and try try different brands. And, you know, if you know that one brand definitely affects you, don't use it. Don't try something else well before, you you know, you, you come to stand on that on that start line and you're confident with your training, swim, bike and run. Are you confident with your nutrition? Um, because that can be, no matter how well prepared you are as a as a triathlete, if you have the wrong nutrition on the day, you'll underperform for sure. And last point I wanted to mention, it's not so much about the preparation, but how long should you expect to recover? How much time should you take off? Again, it's individual, but um, what can you expect at the after 70.3? Because it's a ma- massive event. I'm a big believer. And look, we coach you know elite guys who are in the pro ranks and we coach um, people who are doing their first time. And so we've got everything in between. So the guys who are well-trained, they should be able to recover a lot quicker than the person who's just new at this sport. So the expectation is that you need to have some period where you're allowing yourself to recover from what is a, a massive endurance event, anything from four hours or 350 for the pros to, you know, as I said, six and a half, seven hours. Um, so in a half Ironman, my expectation is that uh, the more experience you have, the less recovery you need. And depending on what, if that is that your last event for the season or is it one of your three or four lead-up races to your A race? So those factors also come into de- determining how much recovery you have. And there's no way I'm going to give people some intensity, you know, straight after they've they've completed a, you know, a really tough uh, half Ironman race. So it could be two weeks. It could be one week, depending on what level you are, as I said, and what your abilities are and how, how well you recover. And we have some really good top athletes who take longer to recover. And, you know, we, we don't know that until we've experienced it. So, so we're learning as coaches and athletes are learning as well that, geez, I didn't give myself enough time to recover from that race. I'm still tired three weeks out you know, from, from that past event. So, so again, it's like nutrition. You need to trial what works for you and don't ever come back sooner just because you're motivated. You know, if you've performed so well and you can't wait for the next training session, that's a great thing. But we know that letting the body absorb the load 
by recovering is going to actually improve us rather than continuing to create fatigue um, the minute you feel like you're okay take extra time you know once you think you, you've got it again take another day and that doesn't mean stop training it just means do easy stuff where you would be in zone one or two swim bike and run you know have some fun with your your, your local mates who, who don't want to ride the, the way you've been training or running or swimming you know go for some coffee rides they're the things that you should be doing the more movement you do post endurance events like half Ironman the, the more you move that's what I'm telling everybody if you're at a desk on a Monday morning you've just done a marathon on a Sunday or a half Ironman on a Sunday move around don't stay at your desk all day you need to keep moving so so these are things that are really important um, you want to keep the, the tendons the joints the muscles functioning with as minimal fatigue creation as possible so that it's like oiling it every day you're just getting things to keep functioning with no intensity or intensity as low as possible um, and if it means just going for a, a, a morning tea walk or or you know just walking around the office if you're an office worker um, you know, these are the things that you should be thinking about doing. And rather than just saying, I'm just going to do nothing for the week, that's actually probably worse mm. than than doing something. Great way to finish. Um, and it's been a big episode. And I think the way we can summarize it is there's a lot to think about with a race like a, a half Ironman, a 70.3. But if you do some of the key golden things we've said in this episode, that'll serve you in such good stead for the actual race. There's some really big things you can tick off, which would get you 80% of the result that you want. Um, there's a lot of little things to think about, but really the things that we spoke about in here are the things we've identified as the major ones that contribute to you getting the best result on race day. So thanks for listening to this episode. It's been a big one. As always, we'll see you on the next one. Mm-hmm.